So welcome back from the break. We will continue now and then now we will go to the work machine domain and we will hear a presentation about intelligent ports. And the presentation will be given by Pekka Ylipaunu, who is the director of automation research at Karkotek and Kalmar. He has a background from automation research in VTT, from where he changed his position to Kalmar in 2003. Currently, Pekka is focusing on automation applied research projects and building a technology strategy and roadmap for coming years. Please go ahead, Pekka. Thank you, Laura. A nice introduction. I will share my presentation. Oh, jumping around. OK, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, what is happening in, inside the port. You already saw in the previous presentation that um, how the ship is uh, or vessel is uh, approaching the port and what kind of communication is needed uh, between the port and, uh, and the vessel itself. And now we go inside the port and uh, what I mean with the intelligent port and what kind of features we have in those ports. Okay, I want to remind you that um, quite many of you already know Calcutta Corporation, but we have these uh, three business areas and uh, Kalmar, MacGregor and Hayab. And uh, Hayab is making uh, making uh, equipment uh, for road trucks and uh, and uh, MacGregor uh, products are mainly mainly installed uh, to the ships. And uh, then when we are talking about Kalmar itself, uh, we are making uh, quite much container handling machines, but uh, also with the smaller machines, we can handle other other cargo like uh, metal rolls and paper rolls and so on. And uh, we are working in, in factories and uh, logistic centers also. And if we are thinking about containers, we can we can say that uh, one in four container movements uh, around the globe is handled by a Kalmar solution. So we really have a global, uh, global business here. and. Uh, Actually, we don't have so many customers uh, in, in Finland, but uh, but if you think about Europe already, we have a lot of customers. Then what I, I mean with this term intelligent port, uh, sometimes uh, some presenters uh, call it a smart port, that is the other term, what you can find in, uh, in articles and uh, in the web. And uh, then I, I mean that uh, then we are really utilizing uh, digital technologies and possibilities what we have there, such as uh, machine learning and data analytics and visualization and cloud uh, servers and, uh, and advanced wireless communication technologies like uh, private 5G and so on. And uh, what, what they affect uh, to the port ecosystem and uh, and uh, what is uh, really affecting to the port ecosystem at the moment is the industry 4.0 principles. And I will show some examples that uh, what is what is really happening in, inside the port at the moment. These are the trends uh, what are happening at the moment uh, in a port. And uh, first, I want to highlight the safety and security. And of course, in, in this uh, security meaning also cyber security. And that is a really hot topic at the moment in, in a port, of course. Maybe you have, some of you have seen that uh, what have happened in, in some terminals that, uh, of course, when, when the automation level is increasing, also the severity of the cyber security is, is also coming more and more important. And, uh, because then this kind of uh, attack can stop the whole operation in a terminal if it's uh, uh, highly automated. And that is why it's, uh, of course, coming more and more important. And of course, safety, as we heard already in the previous presentation, that is always uh, really important when you have really high high loads and uh, big machines and, uh, and already the collisions and against objects uh, that can be really severe. But of course, the human uh, there is can be really a fatality, and you can you can even die in those kind of accidents, and uh, that is happening at the moment in in the terminals, and uh, of course that we are trying to avoid in the future. And then the second topic is uh, harmonization and standardization, and uh, I can say that finally it's coming also to our business area. And uh, meaning that uh, we already have this kind of association, uh, it is called the DIC 4.0, 
and there we are talking with our competitors and uh, with our customers and uh, how to harmonize uh, these things. And of course, uh, in the background, you can see that there's uh, quite many ideas are coming from Industry 4.0, and we are adding those ideas to the both business and uh, in, to our business sector. That is really happening at the moment, and uh, that is really coming more and more important. And then the third one is that uh, now we are also upgrading brownfield terminals, uh, not uh, only making greenfield terminals. Uh, when we started the automation journey, the idea was to uh, automate the greenfield terminal, but uh, they are not so uh, common anymore, and uh, that's why we are also making making quite uh, big modifications to brownfield terminals nowadays. And also small ports and uh, inland terminals are coming more and more into the picture because uh, also they are thinking that how to make uh, make their own uh, operation more efficient and uh, how they can uh, integrate and how they can uh, communicate uh, even better with the uh, bigger terminals and uh, how they can get that information what is what is really needed needed for the efficient operation. And um, as a whole, I can say that the optimization of the whole logistic chain that is coming more and more important. And uh, of course, um, it is quite well known that uh, those uh, big players, uh, car owners like Amazon, Alibaba, and uh, DHL, and uh, so on, they are really trying to affect us sort of the port, uh, port so that uh, they can really see that what is happening inside the port. They have, uh, in some cases, uh, even uh, even said that port is uh, like a black a black hole that they can't see that what is happening inside the port and it, it is not possible in in near future. And of course, avoiding waste and uh, inefficiencies that is really important. And of course, uh, as a whole, sustainability uh, ideas are really important for our customers and. Uh, of course, they are near near the sea, the sensitive environment, and that is one reason. But that is that is really affecting the whole business quite a lot at the moment. But then comes the new service models and uh, players, as you already saw in the previous presentation, that um, quite many new, uh, quite small IT companies are, are coming to this business and. Uh, and making new innovations and uh, giving our customers uh, new opportunities with the uh, software. And of course, uh, I can say that uh, it is also happening in our business area that uh, we have open interfaces now quite a lot and uh, we have standardized interfaces and data sharing is coming more and more into picture. We don't, we can't have these kind of uh, uh, Calmer owned uh, data, and uh, we are owning the data, and or our customer is owning only the data, and it's uh, they are willing to share, and we are willing to share our information, and uh, and that is really beneficial for the whole business. And then the last uh, bullet point, uh, but it's not not least uh, important, uh, it's um, is that the predictability and transparency has said that. Uh, and these kind of logistic uh, companies, uh, they really want to see that what is happening in inside the terminal. And of course, the main main target is that they have really accurate estimates that the, when when the ship can depart or when the truck is ready and they can they can leave the terminal, and or when when the train is ready and so on. These kind of turnaround uh, times and the estimation of those that is really important at the moment in. In seaports, and uh, I want to highlight this um, this picture. And of course, this kind of uh, seaport is really multi-stakeholder environment. And you have, for example, on top of this picture, you can see those port stakeholders and uh, and uh, what we see for our customers like uh, port authorities, terminal operators, normally and shipping lines. Uh, cargo owners that is coming more and more picture it is our customers terminal operators customer and then of course logistic companies and then this kind of uh, players like customs and uh, how they affect uh, to the efficiency of the port but then you have of course um, internet connections and you can have rail and you can have barges those small ships and uh, trucks and so on there are quite many Quite many variations in that one, of course, and uh, what kind of model is our, our customers are utilizing. 
And then port infrastructure is coming more and more important. And uh, what uh, the digitalization is also affecting that one. I can, I can show some examples in the next slide about that one. You know, infrastructure, of course, we have more and more sensors uh, in the infrastructure also, and we can really monitor and uh, it is giving also health information for our customers and for us, and we can really predict uh, things uh, with, with that information uh, that is coming more and more important in, in the future. And about uh, when we are talking about cargo handling, of course, uh, as I said, optimization as a whole is, is really, really important and how to make efficient operation and uh, how to really optimize the space, of course, what is utilized because uh, the port is, is uh, quite a limited area and you can't extend uh, in many cases the area, area quite easily. It is mission impossible even in many cases. And that's one reason is that you have to optimize the space and, uh, and uh, to increase the capacity in that way. And of course, terminal automation, uh, that is why we are investing also to that one. It is, it is growing at the moment a lot and, uh, and it is affecting the smaller terminals in the near future also. And then if we go to uh, customs and collection, data collection, of course, so this information sharing is more and in, in more, and more important and uh, that you have right data, you have it uh, right time and you can, you can really make your decisions accordingly and you can utilize that data and make your own, own process uh, more, more efficient. And uh, about safety and security, I say that, uh, of course, access uh, control is really important. And if you open this kind of hazardous area, as a gate, for example, you are stopping the operation and you have to detect uh, the people who are working inside the area and what they are doing and they are doing doing the right things and they are not uh, going to wrong, wrong areas and so on. They are meaning you know, many, many cases what you can utilize uh, this kind of control systems, what we are, for example, doing at the moment. So it's uh, meaning that the early warning systems are really important and uh, you are avoiding the accidents what can happen in this kind of terminal area. And of course, cybersecurity, as I said, that it is coming more and more important. And uh, as you saw that uh, when you have this kind of multi-stakeholder environment, it is not an easy case and you have to be really careful with that one and you have to follow those uh, standards which um, are quite new still and we have inherited those and we are we are making development accordingly and of course energy and uh, environment things uh, how to reduce energy consumption and uh, how you can monitor environmental impact and how you show it uh, to stakeholders and uh, and that is also really really important for our customers Okay, when we are thinking what is happening at the moment um, globally, we can say that, uh, of course, uh, our customers are using these uh, intelligent systems uh, for business efficiency purposes and also as a computing uh, factor at the moment. It is it is still a uh, really fancy systems and uh, you can really, uh, really say that you are a bit different uh, from your competitor and it is really a competing factor for our customers. And uh, if you think about uh, ports and terminals, uh, then of course, uh, number one are Singapore and Port of Rotterdam, and they are really, really leading the technology at the moment. And if you want to see really advanced uh, sea terminal or seaport, uh, you can look those uh, terminal pages, web pages, and you can see what they are really doing. They, they have so many projects ongoing at the moment, and uh, quite many Finnish companies are also participating to those, uh, those projects already. But then, of course, um, if you think about North Sea area, Antwerpen and Hamburg, they are following and they are really following those industry 4.0 ideas and uh, they are making these kind of um, labs, uh, labs uh, all over Europe area and they are really testing the ideas all the time and, uh, and there's uh, still room for innovations. So terminal operation and port call, they are two entry points uh, where you can uh, start your digitalization journey and there are quite many options already available in, in those two areas. Okay, this is my last slide. And if we talk about research, it is needed both from the strategic perspective and uh, within solution level innovation. So I want to highlight that there is a lot of room to innovations still in both business. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pekka. And then this, this was also a very, very pleasant uh, statement for, for the research uh, participants here that the research is still needed. And, and you, you have already some, some questions or comments in the chat. So if, if you can please then continue the discussion there, there while, while, while we will continue. Yeah, thank you. OK, and, and so we will continue the, the program with, with now going to the uh, road traffic domain and we will have a presentation titled Road Towards Automation. And, and the presentation will be given by Eetu Pillisihvila, who, who is the head of analysis, trials and then research at the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency Traficom. He has previously worked at the agency as an expert on automated driving and ITS, and he was involved in creating the Fini first Finnish roadmap on automated mobility at the Ministry of Transport and Communications in 2015. So, Eetu, please go ahead. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I will briefly brief you on on what the road towards automation looks like uh, in, in, in road traffic, road transport, maybe a bit from the uh, authority, public authority point of view, but also touching on some uh, general issues. When you talk about the state of the art of automation in, in road transport, uh, the focus is uh, typically on, on controlling the vehicles. But uh, there are still also other tasks that are being handled manually that uh, could perhaps benefit from, from some level of automation. So this is a picture from China. There is a bus shouter or a bus yeller uh, who is extending his or her hand from the middle window of the bus. So every time the bus leaves a stop or makes a turn in a crowded intersection, the person, the bus yeller, uh, yells that the bus is leaving, the bus is turning. So I think uh, this is on the simpler side of things that you could automate in road traffic, but uh, the, the control issues are, are a bit more challenging. Uh, on, on just the basic foundations, uh, the levels of automation that are used, uh, uh, developed originally by the SAE International, uh, the big takeaway, I think, from, from this, uh, present this description of the levels is that uh, when it's blue, uh, when the systems are blue, uh, up to level two, uh, human is responsible in the end responsible for everything and for the safe control of the vehicle. And then when you see green from level three upwards, uh, then the system is in control and responsible. And, and, and current systems that you can buy from the store are still level two systems. And, and the kind of, uh, uh, the, we also have uh, in uh, kind of product phase, uh, level, level three systems with limited ODD. So if we have automated shuttles, uh, oh, maybe well, when you have automated shuttles that are uh, kind of designed and planned to be operated in a specific area at certain speeds and maybe limiting the network on which it is used, uh, then you talk about level four. But what you have in both in, in heavy goods vehicles in, in public transport buses and uh, passenger vehicles, we are still talking about level two. And, and this is kind of an important uh, awareness issue on, on okay, what, what the systems are. But in, in addition to the levels, uh, you have uh, the different use cases when you talk about vehicle automation or road traffic automation. It's not just kind of one thing, you have the shuttles in, urban, semi-urban, low-speed environments, you have the normal vehicles, passenger, heavy goods, then you're aiming for the robo-taxi service in, in one corner, uh, Waymo, uh, Uber, Lyft type operations, and then kind of a new addition on, on goods delivery, maybe urban logistics, you have these different types of uh, goods transport vehicles, of which we don't know what they really are, actually. 
And uh, so where are we currently on on the kind of a, on the peak of development and automated driving? Uh, last month, Waymo finally opened uh, its fully driverless taxi service uh, to the general public, so to to everyone interested in in an area of Phoenix. So so this is something that's uh, right now available for anyone in that particular area. They can use the app to summon a driverless uh, taxi uh, vehicle in, in that area. And, uh, and there is no safety driver or anyone on board on, 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 on those rides, on all of those rides. They also continue testing in that area uh, with, with safety drivers, but they have part of their fleet that is already operating fully driverless. Uh, so the kind of common understanding or a combined view, expert views on where the development is uh, company-wise, Waymo is leading the pack with Ford and Cruise pretty close behind. And then maybe another note is that on the bottom side of this, uh, Tesla is seen to be kind of trailing uh, Technology-wise, and uh, this is also from from a public authority point of view, uh, they have not maybe been uh, that uh, transparent about uh, about the limitations of of their systems. So there's been been a bit of a disconnect uh, between the marketing and then what the technology can do, and and this is something that's a serious issue, I think, going forward. Okay, so from from last year, that was kind of a year, a reality check year on on automated vehicle hype cycles, and the kind of uh, managers of the leading companies developing the solutions acknowledged it or acknowledged that okay, this is this is really really hard, and uh, and 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 the problem is so complex that. You, you kind of approach it from, from a geofencing uh, point of view. So limiting the domain where you operate and you simplify the problem in that way. And uh, in Finland, uh, we've had a lot of focus on, on uh, testing on in winter conditions, uh, VTT, uh, National Land Survey, Metropolia, and sensible for very, very visible and uh, roboride lately, lately in the Tampere region on on the shuttle solutions and the technology to kind of operate automated vehicles safely in in challenging conditions. But what's coming next? This is kind of the what are the kind of how does the future look? So. Uh, small delivery robots being uh, tested around the world in in cities, large and small, in different form, and kind of maybe short trips, last mile delivery type operations in kind of urban city logistics with with remote monitoring and remote control center type operations, so that they operate in an automated fashion most of the time. And then when they encounter problematic situations, they contact the remote control center and then ask for advice. And it's it's uh, at this point, it's too early to say how uh, good solutions or how feasible solutions the, these are as, as part of the supply logistic chain, but uh, a lot of these are being tested. Also a similar, similar uh, solution, a slightly bigger vehicle uh, has been tested and will be tested in, in the capital region uh, at Aldo camp, campus area. And uh, it was already earlier tested uh, in France. Uh, but generally, I think the concept of remote monitoring of vehicles is, is also something that will play a larger part in the future in, in, road, tra in road traffic, whether it's uh, transporting people or goods 
or whether it's about the personal mobility of people and you have someone you have a fleet of vehicles and then you have a fleet management uh, service provider there and whether you uh, whether the company is responsible for everything maybe not specializing i see that there will be specialized remote operation providers service providers and uh, in the right corner is the Einright driverless truck vehicle that they have been developing and are testing operating in in select locations in Sweden at least and their pricing model is also something kind of the first iteration of the pricing model is to have a one-off fee right now I think it's ten thousand dollars and then to have a monthly service fee so that the uh, the organization buying the service paying for the service will have uh, 20 hours of operational uptime uh, and good transport capaci capacity uh, equivalent to to a single truck and you have other um, other actors in this field as well and uh, this is kind of a quick example of of how you when when the technology is not uh, fully ready for, to operate uh, all the time everywhere in all conditions then you need to limit the operational domain where the vehicle vehicles operate and this is kind of the model that lyft has been entertaining that you you then need to be you need to know where to drive with your fleet in this case if you want to provide a taxi service with a, with a dri with driverless vehicles so you need to select low speed roads roads streets where there are no bike lanes within the roads and that there are no difficult intersections so that you for example don't need to turn left in four way or more way intersections too many times so right turn only type of logic maybe that's uh, popular in in logistics in in big cities and with, with these limitations, then you can build the operational design domain for, for the ride sharing service that you have and for the vehicles that you have. So you limit the domain environment in, in which you try to operate the vehicle. So you simplify the case. And then you also have the pricing considerations that come into play. Uh, if you're a ride sharing or taxi service provider like Lyft, currently the costs and the risk are all on the drivers that operate as uh, individual entrepreneurs in most cases and countries. So if, if you don't have drivers in the vehicles anymore, then you need someone to own the fleet. <laughs> so, so you need to kind of look at it also. How would it be feasible? What would the vehicles have to cost in order in order for it to be feasible. Last year there was an update on the earth track roadmaps for for different types of use cases. So this one uh, was for for the development path and market introduction for passenger cars and uh, looking at level three functionalities, level three systems, not 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 necessarily or definitely not kind of full level four vehicles that you have level three functionality in a vehicle if you talk about passenger cars and uh, highway autopilot including highway convoying or platooning things so kind of we are in the predicted window but it's it's going up to 26 this this was the estimate from last year and a similar system in an urban suburban setting is seen as little later so the highway autopilot high autopilot would be the next next system to launch. Uh, for urban mobility vehicles, uh, a larger window, so up to 2030. But uh, as as the window shows, we have kind of limited operations, and maybe some you could argue that uh, already available in the market, but with with quite uh, quite limited ODD still but we are kind of already in the window and this kind of matches 
we have seen. So then what's important? The Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications hosted a high level meeting on connected and automated driving last month virtually and uh, the kind of three pillars uh, that uh, are seen and were seen by by the participant as participants as important to focus on in the future were human centricity uh, enhanced data sharing and also a holistic regulatory framework and uh, from from these topics i think on the human centricity centricity side there is uh, need to focus on on the transparency of the systems that are developed so that you can build trust in people also in industry and that you can kind of build uh, increase awareness among among general public on on what the technology does and what it doesn't do and also to show how it contributes to safety and other other societal goals that uh, we're aiming with with the use of automation also the importance of, of of international cooperation with regard to the regulatory framework so the work work at the UNECE both on road traffic rules and uh, and vehicle regulations and kind of synchronizing this with, for example, the CCAM platform work led by the European Commission. Uh, on the trust issue, this was just something kind of, okay, the situation is a bit different depending on, on where you look at it. Chinese are, <laughs> are quite trustful of, of, of self-driving technology, probably because the society around and the solutions already in place uh, are a bit different than maybe in in Europe and in the US but there's not that much uh, technology uh, resistance or fear as in maybe in some other countries so so there's a lot of work to do there on the regulatory developments maybe i will bring up the recent release of the report on the ethics of connected automated vehicles that was developed by an independent expert group uh, led, led or coordinated by, by the Commission, of course, that uh, introduces recommendations on, on going forward with, with automated vehicles, both for industry and, and other stakeholders. So clear, as mentioned before, very important to demonstrate that uh, the vehicles are safe and they reduce the risk of accidents, promoting inherently safe design and a culture of responsibility. And transparency, both on how algorithmic decisions are made by, by the vehicle systems and uh, what is involved in the data collection aspects. I'll maybe skip these and come to the final conclusions. So the impacts uh, of automated driving, they, they fall on all aspects of, of society. And on all cases, it's not clear whether the impacts will be more positive or more negative. But it kind of depends uh, largely on whether the larger trend is towards higher quality individual mobility when you would have more vehicles going around and less use maybe of public transport or whether the trend in the future is towards an uh, automated vehicle enabled public and shared transport which which would then maybe it, it would improve the efficiency of the transport system and open up uh, some opportunities for land use and less traffic uh, typically whether it's with automated or other vehicles means means less less accidents so there's also that type of increase in safety the economic employment impacts are at this point really hard to 
kind of estimate. So uh, the kind of an acu acute problem is is with professional driver shortage uh, around the world. So if, if kind of increased technology that supports the driving task uh, makes makes the driving tasks less stressful, this is something that could kind of help improve the improve the image of the profession of, of a professional driver. <clears throat> so what does the future look? What what can we say pretty pretty certainly? One thing is sure that the different challenges related to human and machine interaction will increase. So there are already and will be quite different systems with different limitations and then people have very different understanding of the systems. So we need to increase that understanding, uh, increase the awareness and focus, focus really hard on, on transparency in, in all parts of the development towards using automated technology. Uh, it's also important to identify measures, investments or otherwise that uh, benefit the society and, and, and the transport system regardless of the pace of development of automated vehicles. So because so much of the development is yet uncertain related to automated vehicles, uh, there's not, you, you cannot kind of put your eggs in one specific basket. You need to hedge, hedge your bets a little bit. Uh, a need for a digital traffic environment, that's pretty clear for automated vehicles and otherwise. So having traffic rules in digital forms across countries, cities, uh, having information on the infrastructure properties, uh, having uh, high definition uh, maps and other uh, available to support, support the use of AV technology. This is one, one important aspect. And then on the legisla legislative or regulatory side, agility is, is called for. So we need to react and adapt as we see where things are headed. We, we need to kind of try to be wise beforehand, but we, we also need to tolerate uncertainty. Uh, we, we want to avoid this type of future. So knowing knowing things, what they will do and not overselling things and uh, being sure that everyone involved understands uh, how things work. Thank you. Thank you, Eto. A lot is also happening with fast speed at, at the road traffic domain. And then so you have also questions in the chat. So, so if you can then continue yeah, discussing yeah, there yeah. afterwards. Yeah, yeah but, but thank you. And so, as I said, this was the, the uh, final seminar of, of the RAS project, but, but of course, we are also thinking about the RAS-related future, uh, and Hannu will now tell you about the plans for that. Yes, thank you, Laura. So, uh, to the end of this webinar, in this presentation, I will shortly go through in a nutshell what are exactly our future plans for RAS activities. So, uh, based on our gained experiences and the current understanding of stakeholder needs. Uh, in future RAS activities, we plan to pay special attention to these following three larger focus areas. So the first one is the coordination of the education and training of autonomy professionals. And the second one is demonstrating the safety of autonomous systems AI solutions to authorities. And the third one there is the ecosystem project building activity. Uh, now, I will actually go through each of these with a separate slide next. So first regarding this coordination of education and training of autonomy professionals. So as you might know, the, the big future challenges related to research and development of autonomous systems are the sufficiency of experts in future workforce, and also how to keep the existing professionals continuously learning and up to date with knowledge in this rapidly developing area. So 
to answer these challenges, we see that a major part of the solution is the increasing of, for example, e-education, digital teaching methods and micro credentials. These micro credentials are sort of like mini qualifications or nano degrees that are more specific than the traditional diplomas and are meant to upskill, for example, the people who are already in workforce. And also the e-learning activities we plan to advance offer this kind of uh, very suitable uh, way to learn new things for the current societal situation where at least knowledge workers and the students are working mostly remotely. So the involved universities actually in RAS, they have provided already some education and training possibilities for the interested people and organizations, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation. But in the future, we really want to facilitate and do this more systematically. So, for example, through this National Doctoral School for Industrial Innovations for Autonomous Systems, which will be organized together with the companies, with the topics and supervisors for the PhD thesis coming partly from the companies, actually. And another big area uh, where we have been advancing is the building of different types of educational networks. So in RAS, uh, we have been recently facilitating and coordinating these kind of networks, for example, to the areas listed there in the slides, like the automated and connected transport for sustainable cities, unmanned aerial systems or drones, and autonomous maritime systems. And well, you will probably hear more about these networks later, maybe already in the beginning of next year, I think. Then uh, the second large basis for future RAS operations will be the expertise and services to help uh, companies certify and demonstrate the safety of their autonomous systems related AI solutions, especially for authorities like Traficom or others. So regarding this uh, as a background, you might have seen the European Commission's white paper published in this year's February related to the strategies for data and AI. And that states that the EU's approach to AI based on trust and excellence will give citizens the confidence to embrace these technologies while encouraging businesses to develop them. And it also mentions that the authorities must be able to check the safety of AI systems similarly as they check, for example, cosmetics, cars or toys. So inspired by this approach, the team for this future safety related operations of RAS will be building trust in autonomous mobility, AI, and actually uh, specifically in defining a systematic way to build evidence-based trust in these systems. And here uh, we will have a special focus in uh, simulation-based verification, validation, and qualification to be conducted before going into the real-world test settings. Or it can be then done in a hybrid combined way with virtual and physical tests simultaneously. So that's another option as well. But all these aims at making sure that the systems are really safe and secure before allowing them to operate in environments where the people or the properties may be in danger. So we do have at the moment quite a lot of details uh, about these plans for the different sectors like the maritime, road and drone systems. But I, I, I will not go through them here. Actually, the uh, discussions about these topics have been going on for quite a while now with the authorities and the companies, especially here, here in Finland. But, but now we also wish to invite all the national and international companies and other organizations who are interested in this area to be in contact with us and tell us how we could advance your wishes and solve your challenges in this topic specifically. OK, then. Finally, uh, RAS will want to continue to act as a catalyst for companies and other stakeholders for this kind of ecosystem type innovation activities, like for example, large international project entities. And in this way, we want to accelerate the introduction of new solutions, especially to the area of autonomous mobility and transport. So basically, uh, what this means is that RAS aims to carry on to support the building of research and business ecosystem projects together with our current and also the new partners who we definitely welcome happily to interact with us. And now, uh, well, a big challenge here, 
of course, related to this is obviously the current situation with COVID-19 in the society. So we cannot meet face to face to brainstorm new things and have these kind of uh, fruitful workshops. But yeah, well, actually, we have uh, quite good facilitation methods and tools for different types of online workshopping as well with this kind of uh, inspiring service design approach for the participants. So just be in contact if you are interested in that. And in this ecosystem building activity, it can be said that the earlier described brass organizational structure that I showed in the first presentation, that will continue to live on and as an existing network. And it's actually quite good that now we have ramped up this network and the processes, and they can be really efficiently utilized in the preparation of these types of new project concepts and consortiums, and also larger ecosystems. Then uh, the final point there uh, that refers to the idea that uh, one clear area where we want to focus our efforts in this ecosystem building activity in the future will be these systemic business legal and operational transformations which are brought by the different levels of autonomy. Uh, we, we see that these kind of topics are really good starting point for new projects in different focus do point, domains instead of just focusing narrowly on some specific, for example, technical topic. So that's it actually. Uh, to the end uh, of this presentation, I just want to yet mention that if you are interested in joining this work that we plan to do and you want to be part of creating the future of autonomy solutions through RAS, just be in touch and uh, well, Thank you everyone for listening. Stay healthy, <laughs> stay safe. That's it on my behalf. So over to you, Laura, for the final words. Okay, thank you, Hanno. So I, I really hope that then in, in the coming years we will meet many times still in, in similar events with the, the future actions then. But yes, as I said, so, so with this, we will now end the, the final seminar of, of the RAS projects. And I, I want to thank all the, the speakers and all the participants for, for the active discussion also in the chat and participation on, on the event here. And as I said, so all the, the presentations and, and recordings will then be distributed to, to all you who have registered to the event afterwards. But but so so with this so, so thank you everyone and, and take care and hopefully we will see in the future again. Thank you and bye bye.